Hi everyone, my name is Ore Kolade and I'm the technical manager for this session today, um, which will be chaired by Dola. Um, thank you so much for taking part in ANH 2022 and we look forward to a robust and interactive session today. A quick reminder that everything you might need to access, the conference materials and program can be found on the ANH Academy website. So thank you so much um, and over to you, Dola. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good day from wherever you are joining us. Yeah, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our session, the session, the side uh, event of uh, African Food Research uh, Network at the Agriculture and Nutrition Health Academic Conference 2022. Uh, we, we are a group of uh, professionals you know, that uh, advancing uh, the science of food and nutrition from the laboratory, industry, and trade nexus. We believe in this mantra because we know that over and above the novelty of uh, science, it makes no sense if it does not connect with the industry and the trader uh, segment of the, of the value chain, because these two are the ultimate uh, distributor that are going to take the science to the end user. And so that's why, uh, we are trying to set up this orientation in on the continent. So we have representative in uh, each African country, as many as we can uh, you know, can gather, you know, and so we are all trying to advance uh, food and nutrition science through the Nexus. All right, today our session is going to uh, kind of uh, uh, reorientate us as to the least common mission that uh, professionals in food sector should be um should be handling together and that's why uh we are going to uh, start by introducing ourselves we are consulting non-profit organization a network of professionals as said um we advance food and nutrition science through the nexus of industry trade and partnership so you can begin to ruminate over the kind of uh, you know professionals that we have or the angle from which we are are coming from we are going to be diff we are rethinking science in a nutshell and that's uh that's uh, who we are so i'd like to start by um whetting our appetites you know about what an ideal situation should be in between research and business research is supposed to uh um churn out dependable data you know that the industry can utilize you know to to make sure that they deliver Healthy product, healthy food product, uh, as that is uh, uh, the product that connects with us, you know, healthy food product to the populace and also increase the country's or the uh, national or continental GDP by way of a uh, business. You know, if this is an ideal situation, the question then to ask would be that uh, in Africa, where we are concerned about what is the relationship between research and business, we'll find on, on research the stakeholders that are listed on the left, and you also find the, the those in trade and business investment on the right. Uh, in case I've missed out any uh, stakeholder, I'm sure they will be connected with any one of these uh, listed one. You know, but uh, I made this uh, representation more particularly to draw up the what the situation is in Africa and what we would like the change that we would like to happen and the role of research scientists in this uh, mix. Research and business are supposed to be collaborators. You know, and policymakers are supposed to be the platform within which a budding and sustainable relationship uh, continues to exist between research and business. Unfortunately, the those that are supposed to create that platform, the policy that is those that are supposed to make that policy to ensure that we have a, a, a consistent relationship, they are politicians, and uh, the language of politicians seems to be different from everybody. And uh, what do we see? that we lack funding, uh, we lack equipment, facilities to turn out credible and dependable science uh, that will be picked up by industry. So the industry usually generate their own science, you know, which most of the time academics sometimes criticize, which most of the time is not, uh, you know, uh, um, it doesn't all go well, you know, for, for clean chemistry, but uh, do we, we can't blame them, you know, uh, and so they try as much as possible to uh, to have a research and development, uh, you know, departments 
uh, but we don't see ourselves as collaborators and they don't come to academic and research for, for, for to generate uh, hypotheses, you know, that will ultimately improve the delivery of uh, food and, I mean, uh, good and nutritious food uh, to the society. So what we what we see uh, is what we manage in terms of the food uh, that is uh, uh, being distributed in the society. Okay, but that's why we think that we are the one that, as professionals, we are the ones that should generate solution by ourselves. And how do we do this? We need to rethink what we do when we meet, what we do when uh, we meet uh, each other. That is, and where do we meet each other? It's usually at conferences and summits. You know, so the question to ask ourselves is that our conferences and summit are they usually academic or professional? In my own view, in the view of many of my, our members in Africa, they are usually too academic to to churn out sustainable solution to the uh, the society that we are responsible to, and so we feel that. Uh, the science that we we that we operate mostly are coded science. We publish, you know, uh, like the adage that, uh, that they say in the academic environment: publish or perish. You know, if you don't publish, you know, you you don't get promoted, you don't get advanced in your career, and all of that. You know, but these publications, do they the, the solutions that we put in there? Do they actually get to the street where the where the challenges or the, 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 the people that actually need the solution. This can happen if we have a paradigm uh, shift actually. Then we talk of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary conferences, but in delivery, in implementation, are they actually multidisciplinary? So in Afrin, we have a suggestion. Yeah. And the suggestion is born out of the fact that we, 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 we are still struggling with the, with the answer to this question. That are we really meeting expectations? So how, how do we unpack this? We try to see, okay, what, what are the expectations from the society? And uh, the Association for the Study of Food and Society are actually put this in perspective. And the perspective is very similar to how Afrin is thinking. And they believe that the science the, uh, of food must connect with the society at the society's level. Because why, why we exist is actually because of the society. So if we make our science too, too deep, less open, it, the solution won't get to them. And at the end of the day, the business people who, who most of the time are not necessarily uh, 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 scientists, you know, or do not necessarily know, understand the science of the food, we keep churning out the food product that the populace are going to be eating. But in Africa, because we don't have uh, traceability and uh, um, um, epidemiology uh, uh, system uh, and our forensic, you know, when it comes to forensic to trace the causes of illnesses and, and all of that is still not advanced. So we couldn't trace, most of the time we, we are unable to trace the source of uh, uh, non-communicable uh, diseases to the food that have been consumed that have been produced by quacks, you know, uh, forgive me to use that word, it's uh, because of the lack of a, a better word. But when you see our, our SMEs, micro enterprises and the way they, uh, the way they produce their food, you can't blame them because they are business people. They will think about business first. So what is the least common mission that we are suggesting? We are suggesting that science should be made open. And in making science open, it is very easy. In our conversation and implementation, we need to be open. We need to be deliberate about making uh, 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 science uh, uh, open. And how do we do this? When we meet at conferences and summits, we, we should be able to set out like five-year strategic plan, five-year uh, goal, such that we can then come up with clusters, clusters from the industry, clusters from uh, the scientific uh, community, the laboratory, and clusters from the traders, the traders on the street, the, the street vendors and the likes, the, 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 the uh, micro enterprises uh, uh, processing uh, um, clusters. We need them because they are the ones that uh, ultimately uh, distribute or produce to the end user. You know? Because if you can give them good science, they are going to sell their own kind of science. And so when we hold summits and conferences, we must be deliberate about making sure that they are part of the conversation. If it is, uh, if it is uh, 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 any strategy that could make them, you know, to be part of uh, the conversation, we need to start looking at such a, a strategy. Not to take too much of our time, I have a suggestion that can work in this regard. That let's look at the summit, for instance, this kind of summit that we are in. We need to have an overall objective, and, and that is quite uh, clear. We do have overall uh, objective, but we need to break uh, uh, such objective done into clusters, into the laboratory clusters, into the industry uh, clusters, into the traders uh, clusters, you know, and let this team actually align 
to the overall objective. They are going to have their own objective that they are going to set up rising up from such a summit. And then individual, of course, either you are a laboratory scientist, you are a food research scientist, you are a lecturer, you are, you are a professor in a particular field and all that, you need to then be able to uh, uh, decompose or cascade this uh, 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 objective into how you come up with your hypothesis and the kind of research that you do that way we will be relevant into the uh, the, the the overall objective and so the 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 hand uh, step that we are going to now do is to now start uh, measuring and start tracking uh, the activities of these clusters each time we then meet so that we'll be measuring how far and how fast we are moving and by this uh, we need performance management to as a component of our summit and our conferences. And with that, we'll be able to uh, review progress. And during the time between the previous session uh, of the conference and the next one, we'll have documentation and conversation that can go on virtually anyway, that can go on by email, that can go on by you know, Zoom meetings and all of that. So that at the end of the day, by the time we are meeting again, we already have smart objectives again to to deliberate on, you know, by measuring the progress that we have been able to make. But when we have something that everybody comes to present, you know, and uh, you know, we look at the novelty of the science, we hear the person, we say, okay, it's fine, and and we go back to our respective uh, places. We have not helped the society solve a problem uh, if we continue to do it that way. So, if we have uh, uh, clusters that uh, that see themselves a partnership in progress and come up with relevant objectives to to individual clusters like that, that are clearly defined for them and is balanced in such a way that when the output finally come together, we are gonna to be addressing a particular issue or some issues uh, that are food related uh, in the society, uh, since that is our area as uh, agriculture, nutrition and health uh, you know, practitioners. Um, and that's why I'm mentioning food, and, which is relevant to us. But this can also be you know, adapted into other uh, field of science, as the case may be. All right, so what are we suggesting in a, in a nutshell? Yeah, we are suggesting that our summit should be society driven in terms of the goals that we are trying to achieve, then we should be deliberate on partnership, the kind of uh, clusters that we build and uh, we bring together. Then we should encourage private sector conversation, the laboratories, the research objectives, and, and the trade and investment uh, uh, initiative in it need the private sector conversation. Those are the people that are driven by motive and they are driven by motive uh, and they deliver to the uh, society. So it's going to be a win-win situation for everyone. The, the, the motive that, uh, uh, that, that, that drives a professor or a scientist is different from uh, the one that drives a businessman. But ultimately, they are partners in progress if they have the orientation that we are trying to suggest. Yeah. Then government need to play their role. They need to play their role in, in sense that, okay, they need to come up with a governance innovation. And by doing this, we also need to participate and be involved in in politics, you know, when we say be involved in politics as scientists, we need to get interested in who becomes, you know, the, the health minister, the, uh, the the food processing uh, minister. For instance, food processing minister is not is not a position in many countries, but there is a country that has food processing minister. It means that they value science and they value uh, uh, the, the relationship between health and the food that we consume. So they they evolve a ministry dedicated uh, for that. This need this need to also spread uh, around. This model need to spread around. Uh, African continent. Um, by by the time we have this kind of uh, uh, this kind of orientation, we need to keep tracking our performance and progress. And by this, uh, we believe in Africa that if we start, uh, you know, designing our conferences and summit this way, uh, yeah, the, the continent will be better for it, and also the global uh, community will be better for it. Thank you very much. And my colleague, we take it from here to to talk about the relevance of. Um, uh, uh, science in homes, and also the the role of uh, food safety across the value chain, and the challenges of the stakeholders, and how to mitigate uh, these challenges. EC will also uh, come up to talk about food marketing and how best to how it all makes sense from science to the society. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now stop sharing. I will allow uh, my uh, colleague to please share his screen, uh, Professor Badino. Uh, over to you, sir. Good day to everyone that is here joining us in this meeting. Uh, my name is Adewale Olusegu Obadino. Uh, I work for the Federal University of Agriculture, Abeokuta, in the Department of Food Science and Technology. I'm here today 
to talk on a topic, food safety in Africa, challenges and opportunities. As a way of introduction, uh, Africa is known to be the world second largest and second most populous continent after Asia. And it has also been uh, documented that 30.3 million kilometers square, including adjacent islands, this is where Africa is covering in the old world, and this is 6% of the Earth's total surface area. And it is expected that this number, as of 2018, which was 13 billion people in the continent, is about 16% of the world human population. With this huge number of people in Africa, there is a crisis of food security. And this has made it uh, serious to the extent that close to a billion people are not having access to affordable diets. Therefore, there is need for African agriculture to undergo a systemic transformation if you want to meet the rising food demand. And also, if you want to address the public health burden of foodborne illnesses among the most vulnerable population in the continent. And as we know that the continent is expressing, experiencing rapid expansion in the area of agri-food markets. And this has been fueled by the high population growth, rapid urbanization and income growth within the continent. But we need to note that the future development of food systems must be accompanied by cross-sectoral and intergovernmental efforts to reduce the challenge of foodborne diseases within the continent. Africa as a continent has the world's highest per capita incidence of foodborne illnesses. And it has also been documented that about 137,000 lives in a year have been claimed as a result of this foodborne illnesses. Foodborne illness presents significant constraint to low and medium income countries like Africa. And this is costing the government about $110 billion as a loss in productivity and medical expenses yearly. When we talk about the challenges of football illnesses, which is also known to be food safety in the continent, there are uh, simple ways by which we can categorize these challenges. I've tried to put them under five headings here. And uh, number one is the problem of hazards being carried over from the raw material to the final foods that we consume. This hazard can be microbial and they can also be chemical in nature. It is also noted that there's unacceptable trade activities by processors and sellers of the foods that we consume in Africa. It has also been noted that most of these foods are processed under all hygienic practices and environment, most especially since many of the food that we consume in this continent are obtained from open markets. So it's a big challenge. There's also this problem of post-processing contamination of our food, even though if the processor try as much as possible to process the food safe under a safe and hygienic condition, we still have a lot of post-processing contamination that affects the safety of the food that we consume. Uh, lastly, I've also tried to pull some other challenges under improper storage practices, which is also a big challenge in this continent, and improper food safety knowledge by majority of the players along the value chain. But the good news is that we have opportunities. Yeah, uh, of recent, uh, the African leaders 
met under the platform of African Union and the Malabo Declaration was made on agricultural produce. And to be able to achieve this declaration, there has been a link between food safety and agricultural development in order to integrate investment by African nations. So when we're talking about agricultural development in the continent, the issue of food safety is key. And this declaration has also made it possible to ratify the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And this is expected to boost intra-regional trade of agri-food products by almost 70% among the 54 countries within the uh, block. And the idea is that food products will be able to move among different countries within the continent. And if this is going to happen, it means that the food have to meet up with the expected regional standards in which food safety is key. So we can say that there is a great opportunity, but we need to key in into these opportunities. Now, how can we achieve these opportunities? And this is where all the people along the uh, stake, I mean, the stakeholders along the chain have to now be involved. Uh, the, the government, the government, the policymakers have a key role to play. And this is that the political momentum in food safety by these uh, policymakers must continue at high level. They need to make decisions that will ensure that policy objectives and resources are invested to modernize food control system. Once this is done, we're sure that we're going to have more safer food for consumption and also for trade, and people will get more money and there will be good health. The academia also have a role to play in the area of data collection. When we talk about food safety challenges within the continent, most of the data that we use are data that have been generated and provided by organizations outside the continent. But we need our own data. We need to know who are those traders, who are the informal people involved in food processing? What is the major challenge? What are the major hazards that we, we, we need to tackle along the food value chain? In terms of the microbia, in terms of the chemical hazard, we need to get all this data right. So the academia has a role to play in this and also the research institute. The consumers need to be enlightened. There's need for awareness. There needs for communication. There's need for a group of people, NGOs, the government, to raise awareness about the problems of food safety within the continent and also let them know why they need to do a part, why they need to do this and why they should not do this and what are the solutions. When we do this, the consumers will be aware, they will know what they need to do to make their food safe and also the processors will know what to do. And this can be achieved if we are ready to do it. Uh, there is need to teach and help the informal sector on how they can go about abiding with the SPS measures and the TBT requirement rather than working on policy. Of course, the government, most of the time, they generate policies, they produce policies, but the challenge is that the actors that need to work on these policies to make them uh, work, to make them get the objectives and the outcomes are not really aware. And how can we make this uh, awareness? A program like this is one way of doing this. And we also need to go out there and talk to the people along the food value chain and make them to be aware of all these challenges. There is need to establish standards. We need our own standards within the continent. There's need for harmonization of regulations and equivalent of standard between countries. So there's need for the continent to come up with standards that is meant for the continent 
And at the same time, wish every player within the value chain in all the countries can also integrate into. And that is going to be simple and easy to comply with. It requires the increased coordination among African countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, in quick succession, we will then have Dr. Beatrice Ogana Ikujayo to make our presentation. Well, I would like to start by reminding us and then letting us know that the knowledge of food and its chemical composition and the function food performs in the body is a rudiment to understanding how to manipulate food stuff to obtain its maximum benefits to health. And I also know that we should not just be eating to stay alive. We should actually eat to ensure health and wellness at all times, particularly in these austere times arising from the COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant inflation of food stock. It is important that every individual and families equip themselves with the basic skills of how to manipulate food stock through food selection and meal planning. Actually, most times people just eat what is available. They don't really make deliberate plans on what they are going to eat ahead of time. And that is why most times when we eat, we don't derive the benefits of what we have eaten because we have not arranged or manipulated it in a way that will get the optimum potentials of the food we eat. So our family meals prepared and consumed must be carefully selected and planned and a meal timetable written out and pasted for all to see. So that when that is done, everybody looks forward to what to eat and then um, it sort of adds excitement and making food, uh, food consumption more essential to and important to the individual. Uh, apart from all that, doing this will also reduce the monotony of eating the same kind of food all over the time. And then uh, we also provide variety among other benefits. Most times, we, even though we are blessed with tons and hundreds, so I'm, I'm saying that family meals should be prepared to be well selected, planned and prepared so that um, we consume them. And then um, most me after planning, there should be a meal timetable written out and pasted for all family members to see. Maybe for the week, the meal that will be prepared for the whole week is pasted in one corner of the room. So that people look forward to eating. And then uh, when you do that planning, you find out that you are going to be providing all the foods that will meet the nutritional requirements of the individuals and families according to their needs, their physiological composition and the job they do. And also apart from that, this will also reduce the monotony of eating the same kind of food all the time and add variety among other benefits. And uh, as a home economist, we usually am advocating that for us to be able to plan these meals, for us to get all the benefits of the nutrition that we consume, the, there is a food, a six food guide pyramid, which has been advocated by a very seasoned nutritionist over the year, Professor Rete Enobong, and I am going to talk about them. That, and if we apply them and use the food guide in planning our meals, we have the, will be guaranteed of the adequacy of the meals we consume that will meet our daily food requirements. And the food, food, uh, food six food guide pyramid is the first one is, we have the starchy roots, tubers and seeds on a daily basis. In fact, most they include meat, seafoods, legumes, nuts, and seeds. These are good sources of animal and plant protein and also rich sources of minerals. We have uh, the examples include uh, seafood, the crabs, crayfish, meat, fish, organ meats, nuts, granuts, almonds, and so on. And we also have the third group, fats and oils. We all know that these are high density energy foods, but 
The significant part of fat and oil is that they are very rich in fat soluble vitamins, which are the vitamins A, D, E, and K. I'm not going to go into the functions, but let's just go through so that we get the benefits of this presentation. While the fourth food group are the vegetables, and when we talk of vegetables, we are talking about the leafy vegetables, the fruit vegetables, like the tomatoes, the okra, then we have the leafy vegetables, the pumpkin leaves, the salosia, uh, the spinach. Then we have also immature seed vegetables like our runner beans, green peas, and so on. And they are very high sources of dietary fiber and vitamins and minerals. Then the fifth group are the fruits. These are our conventional fruits, the oranges, banana apples, uh, tangerine, and all that. They are also good sources of vitamins and minerals. And the, the final group is the sixth, the sixth group. I call them other foods. There we have our herbs and spices, condiments, seasonings, and other food additives. You all agree with me that there's no way we prepare our meals at all, and we don't add all these condiments. And it will be interesting to know that this condiment also can be used to contribute significant amounts of micronutrients into our daily diets. And they're also rich in phytonutrients. These are not actually nutrients, but they have been known to contribute significantly to the health and wellness of individuals. For example, are the lycopenes and the anthocyanins three foods stuff from each group in preparing just one meal. This is, is important because one to be sorry to be productive, we have to ensure that we enjoy good nutritional status so that we'll be able to contribute optimally to all that we do, whether in our job, in our workplaces, or in our voluntary activity, or even at home. Because we know when there is well, when you are healthy, and then there is absence of disease. It helps the, the psychology of the family, apart from the physical worries, is also reduced. We all know what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was those that had uh, uh, health issues that were more affected. And it, studies have shown that when you enjoy good nutritional status, even when disease comes in, the effect of the disease or the infection is reduced. So. After planning our meals, and uh, we have now had a, 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 the amount of food from each group represented in our meals, there's also what I want us to note that will help to ensure optimum health and benefit of the food we have consumed. One of them is that we, is the uh, knowledge of basic science of food and nutrition, where we bring it into food preparation. For example, in the cooking method we are going to use to cook, we should use methods of cooking that conserve nutrients in the food so that when we, even though we have done a good selection and planning of our meals, in the preparation itself, we don't use method that help to compromise those nutrients and sort of destroy them. So we use conservative cooking method like steaming, then boiling the food with just enough water that we cook the food so that you don't need to expel the leftover water after your food has been cooked. Because when you do that, the nutrient that has leached into the cooking water is lost, particularly the micronutrients like the minerals that are heat laid by that will leach into the cooking water. Then I also advocate that we cook our foods whole, particularly the tubers and the roots. You wash them, cook them first before peeling. Because when you do that, you retain the nutrient within the food and there is no wastage. Because during peeling, we waste a lot of food stuff peeling before preparing. But when we cook and now pillow, you find that it's the thin layer of the skin that goes off easily, like the cocoa yam, the potatoes, and so on. Then I also advocate that we wash our fruits and vegetables before cutting. It's a very good skill and technique because when you wash, you remove all the microbes and all the dirt and all the trash. Like Professor Badina said, food safety is key. So washing helps you to also reduce the contaminants in the food, in the residue from the fertilizer that we are used in growing the food. You wash them first, then you cut. So, and when you, mainly you cut your fruits and vegetables, you consume them or you cook them immediately and you don't cook them for long. Because not, mind you, why we do that is that most of these nutrients, like I said earlier, are heat labor. So they are likely to evaporate, especially the vitamin C content of the food. When you cut them and leave them over time, 
on the table or on the counter before using them or consuming them. Then there are some fruits and vegetables that uh, you can consume raw. Why cook them if you can consume them raw? Like the carrots, you, the cabbage, the cucumbers, why blanch or cook them? When you cook them, you're also compromising the micronutrients that are heat laid by. So the one that can be eaten raw, should be eaten raw, but should be washed properly so that you don't take them and it causes a food contamination. And if possible, don't overcook your food because overcooking the food reduces the flavor, it spoils the taste, and also apart from uh, reducing or damaging the nutrient content. Then I want to talk about what we now know known as new foods to us Africa, particularly in Nigeria, which we are not, are not really our indigenous food, but they are foods that have come up as a result of technology and food processing. Like we have our noodles, the Pringles, and all those foods that are processed into other foods. Yes, most of them are very high in carbohydrates and fat, but no problem, no, 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 no worries. While consuming them, we can enrich them with our natural fruits and vegetables. And we can also add our eggs to eat, because eggs, animal, why well, I'm advocating eggs, especially for the growing children that need a lot of animal protein. We all know the cost of meat now, but egg, when compared to other foods, are still within, are still reasonably cheaper. So you want to make your noodles, why just cook your noodles and add the ingredients? You can chop some carrots into it, add some peas, add onions, add pepper, add crayfish, then break an egg into it. And you see the flavor oozing, and apart from the flavor oozing, it's also very, very nutritious. My parting shot tonight is that we all know that Africa, and we are blessed with hundreds and tons of varieties of foods for both the indigenous ones and the new ones and the imported ones. But it's, it will be, we'll, not, we'll be doing a disservice to ourselves if we don't plan our meals using this six food guide pyramid so that we're able to incorporate and consume all of them together at the same time so that the optimum benefit of spending so much money and time preparing the food is not lost. So the key is to use the food groupings in selecting our foods and ensuring that all foods from the six food groups are selected, I'm advocating at least three from each group. And this will help us to prepare adequate meals and meet our daily nutritional requirements to make us healthy and uh, be alive to pursue our family objectives. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I've been able to add value to our family meals at this presentation. Thank you very much. And I commend our friend for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, and uh, the uh, aim of our friend to uh, bring uh, uh, this uh, bridge is to, is, is to resonate the fact that uh, the science of food will not get to our home if we not build the bridge of home economics, because uh, the home is where food is served. So if we have um, a field that understand the science and also understand how the home operates, you know, and, and uh, we is able to now link it together, I think we should always work in partnership. And that's, that's, that's uh, uh, the essence of uh, my own earlier presentation that we should always form uh, clusters, you know, because if the education gets to home pre meal preparation, that is the science goes into meal preparation. It wouldn't matter whether it is expensive or, or, or not. I mean, uh, healthy food is expensive, but what you are trying to ad advocate, if I get your point very well, is that meal planning can actually address that. You can get uh, cheaper alternatives and, you know, once you understand uh, the, the strengths and weakness of each nutrient, you will know uh, how to process them to get the, the, the a nutrient out of it ultimately. Then also, okay, the alternative, the cheaper alternative to uh, different kind of essential nutrients. If you if you have uh, the idea and the knowledge about it, you can source for your cheaper alternative and still uh, enjoy uh, the nutrient in there. But this knowledge needs to get out, and that's why we must always um, organize, uh, have our conversation and implementation strategy in in clusters together so that we can better deliver to the society that needs us. All right, the last presentation in our uh, session uh, uh, is uh, from EC. 
But unfortunately, still now, EC is unable to, to make it. So I'm going to try as much as possible Sunday to just make a, a presentation on his behalf, but I will not be presenting. I will only, because I will only be um, discussing his notes, you know, and so that way uh, I'll be discussing what he wish to tell us. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Then we'll go to quickly to a uh, question and answer uh, session. Okay, please, uh, you have to forgive me. It soon go on. I uh, will have to work with this because uh, this live mode wouldn't uh, uh, give me access to the notes. Please forgive me. All right. So yeah, Izzy is trying to uh, just uh, share with us where it all makes sense. That is the science, uh, the, the over and above the novelty of uh, science. Where does it make sense to, you know, the people uh, in the trade segment, those who invest in uh, consumer foods, I mean, consumer goods generally uh, with regards to food and those who consume food, where does it make sense? And it makes sense at, at a point where food meets the people. And uh, we are at a situation currently where the global food system is uh, very susceptible to disruption from harmed uh, conflicts, you know, pandemics and climate change induced natural disasters, you know. So uh, in, in, in the midst of uh, uh, the growing population, you know, at an exponential rate at that, you know, we have an issue that to, to address. Uh, how is food being marketed into the society? Is it in the best interest of the global community or not? Recent global events have highlighted the susceptibility of uh, current food system to disruption, you know, caused by wars and, you know, uh, unfortunate circumstances that we can barely help, you know. Added to that is the growing population, you know, which is projected to be over 2 billion uh, 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 people over the next 30 years. So the time to act is now. So it, it, it is obvious that uh, the uh, extensive uh, uh, changes and uh, improvement, you know, must be made uh, uh, to our current uh, food system. So, and how, how is that uh, going to be uh, achieved? He, he, he would love to share some lights at the end of the tunnel, so it's not uh, all uh, disasters and challenges, you know. Technological advances, you know, uh, and uh, with evidence, you know, hold so much promise for science-led innovation for the provision of affordable, safe, nutritious, and planetary health sustainable and consumerly, I mean, consumer accepted uh, uh, food supply, you know. And this is a recent uh, observation. So the, the observation is that uh, consumer research uh, needs uh, to go, in, uh, I mean, needs to move in as a drivers of uh, consumer preferences. You know, so when, when we produce food, when we, we market food, consumer preferences should form the bedrock of our production. And that, that also connects with uh, our earlier position that our research objective should be bottom up. What do consumers need? should be the one that would dictate, dictate the direction of our research objective in the academics, you know, because you cannot sell what is not demanded, you know. So if we keep churning out uh, science that is not needed, uh, uh, it, it helps no one. And so it will end up leaving the, 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 the people who doesn't understand uh, the, the science of uh, food processing to be in the game because they are in the game for business. But should we, shouldn't we as researchers uh, start thinking that, okay, my own business is to shun out novel chemistry, novel food uh, science, but I need to deliver it and market it in a way that the, it, it will uh, ultimately interest the end user. And so to do that, we need to bring those micro enterprises into our conversation, you know. So opportunities for this exist in Africa because the micro enterprises community is very large and they are connected with the society more and directly than the researchers. But if we generate our summit, I mean, if we design our summit in such a way that we have collective conversation, we can begin to address this. And this can be achieved, you know, by, by what uh, we are trying to offer at the African Food Research Network. We have, an, we have our mantra is, is about uh, advancing food science and technology for the society through the laboratory, the industry, and the trade nexus. So that at the end of the day, we are all speaking one voice, from our perspective and together we are we are advancing our society and improving it you know for planetary health uh, awesome food uh, consumption and uh, all the other indigenous foods that are that are yet to be tapped can be tapped into 
and marketed appropriately and make sure that they get to the end user in the most and the safest uh, possible uh, uh, form. All right. I hope uh, I've, uh, I've tried. I can't be easy, but uh, I, I hope after uh, seeing this recording, he will give me a pat at the back that, okay, probably I try to uh, speak uh, his voice. So I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can quickly go to uh, uh, the, the question and answer session. And uh, many thanks to Ore for, for agreeing to uh, please and uh, take care of this session on our behalf. She must have harvested some uh, questions and we're more than happy to interact with people. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're still waiting for some questions to come through. We have quite a lot of comments, but um, I'm not so many questions. Someone, has, someone is asking if the food pyramid can be shown. So I don't know if... Um, Beatrice, I don't know if you have a picture of the food pyramid. Yes, but I have it somewhere that I can assess it now. But let me just explain. The, what you have there is just like turning it upside down. When you turn that upside down, it goes up like a pyramid. So at the base is where we have our starchy roots. It's wider. If you know how a pyramid looks like, it is wider at the base. And as it tapers up, it narrows down gradually until it gets to the peak. So turning that table, if you have it to share now, is the first one at the lower form is the starchy roots, tubers, and cereals, which we, it for is the basis of most of the food we eat. Then we start building on the starchy roots, tubers, and cereals. We have the meat, seafood, legumes, nuts, and seed. Then we have the fats and oil, and it's tapering up, getting narrower. Then we have the vegetables. We have the fruits. Then we have finally the at the peak, at the end of the pyramid, we have the uh, other food that I refer to as the herbs, spices, condiments, and seasoning. Uh, are right. there any other people who have questions? You yeah. Can please raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So somebody has just posted a question. Can I read out the question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, somebody is asking, what are the efforts of science and technology on the issue of food preservation? It goes a long way when talking about adequate healthy foods for the family. That's the question asked by Link Unisa Data. Thank you. Let me just, we have a few minutes to go. Let me just say a few things within the next two minutes or one minute. Is that science and technology, especially food science, have done a lot to assist in this area of preservation. Because we know that, of course, many of our produce are available, but they are seasonal. And we have uh, our own natural methods that is scientific, uh, that are scientific backup to extend the shelf life of this food to make them available all year round. For example, for fruit and vegetables, uh, we have this method that is called uh, pot in pots, where you know that, of course, we need the low temperature to make the produce uh, available. I mean, to extend the shelf life of the produce, that's a result of no availability of electricity. So you can use this method to extend the shelf life of the produce. Another way that food science as a discipline are also used to contribute to extension of shelf life of food is to do little processing. For example, we are talking about, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, fruits. You can extract your fruit in a safe way and you can also boil it, which is a way of pasteurizing it and can it in a bottle to extend the shelf life. And there's all these other uh, new innovative methods that you can also use with your food. There are methods where you can coat, okay, to extend. So because of our time, we may not be able to uh, spread out all days that has been done. But there are a lot that has been done within the continent that can help to extend the shelf life of produce. So let me stop there for others to contribute or to ask. Thank you. I also want to add okay. that, uh, that uh, food preservation has also helped us to have food all year round, whether in season and off season. So that is one of the advantage of food preservation. We can assess any kind of food, no matter the season of the year. Mm. Thank mm. you. 
All right. Um, okay, I will allow for one more question. Um, I can see a, a one more hand from Ade Tola, Ade Tumobi. Please go ahead. Yeah, I want to commend the organizers of, uh, of this uh, uh, platform. My question is this. How can we link food science, food preparation, and the small older family members? Because I remember when uh, Dr. Organa, Beatrice Organa Ikujenyo was mentioning meal preparation, a lot of Nigerian family members, they are after what to eat. They are not concerned about the nutritional cons uh, contributions of the meal preparation. How can we, how can we now link the Nigerian family household to what you have done today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would I would like to quickly address that so that uh, yeah, um, or I can then close the session. That this is the essence of uh, holding our session, and this is what our friends stand for to bring together all the uh, clusters. The arising from that, we will we'll have uh, what you call um, a communicate and advisory. You know, which we are going to disseminate to the public and through our website, it will reach everybody, it will reach the, the global the, 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 the global space uh, of which you are a member, and particularly those that have joined this uh, session, so that you can then become ambassador of this rearrangement that we are trying to build. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone for joining um, this session and thank you to all our presenters um, for um, the discussion as well and for those to those who ask questions. All right, everyone have a great evening or afternoon wherever you are and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye.